The following episode of The Kingdom of Isolation contains footage from the film being discussed. The footage is used solely for the purposes of education, commentary, and criticism under fair use. Please support the animators by watching this film on Disney Plus or home media where available. This episode also contains spoilers throughout. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs, et bienvenue au Royaume de Lisimo. Or to translate into English, hello, my fellow Pixar fans, and welcome to the latest episode of The Kingdom of Isolation, where in times of trouble, why not isolate yourself with the magic of Pixar? Now, in the last episode, we managed to hit 50 episodes in The Kingdom of Isolation, and that's including all the specials that we've done so far. So I said it in the last episode, and I'll say it again here. Massive thanks to everybody that has supported the series uh, so far, not just over the first 50 episodes, but over the course of the two years that we've been doing this uh, so far. But today it is time to cook up a storm with the last Pixar film we're going to be covering um, for the foreseeable future with Ratatouille released in 2007, the second Pixar film to be directed by uh, Brad Bird. But of course, it wouldn't be The Kingdom of Isolation without having a guest on board for this series. Uh, his most recent appearance was with this year's anniversary special, having one last trip through the Renaissance and how they ranked based on the percentage scores that they got here in the Kingdom of Isolation. My sous chef for this evening, it is uh, Alan Santa. You dumbass! And yes, I did pronounce his first name in French. So there you go. Bonjour, Alan. <laughs> Bonsoir, mes amis. There we go. Yes, yes, I still know my I still know my basic French folks. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> but yeah, um, much like uh Hunchback um last summer, this is an, this is another one of those films that you've been eagerly anticipating covering with me. Yep, it's one of my favorite animated movies of all time. Yeah, it, and uh, after me what after me watching it um this week. It's it's definitely um I would definitely have to agree it is definitely up there as one of the best films that Pixar's ever done, and mm -hmm. this this is probably the start of like peak Pixar era Ratatouille Wally -E, Up and Toy Story three four Oscar winners back to back this like this is probably the best era for Pixar in terms of their in terms of like the best success that they um that they had after the yeah. after the okay reception that uh, that cars got mm. but uh but anyway i but anyway this i say this one is just there's no other word for it this one is just an absolute gem in uh, pixar's catalog and a couple of animation historians have even said that this is pixar's magnum opus akin to The Lion King being Disney's uh, magnum opus. And you know what? I would agree. I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, let's not waste any more time because uh, the last thing we want to do is keep these customers waiting. So uh, let's, um, let's, get those, uh, ovens <laughs> let's get those ovens turned on and turn up the heat as we go, about, go on about Ratatouille. So... Opening credits. And How then many we... food metaphors can we expect in this video? Hmm. Let's find out. <laughs> but yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah. The, see, the, but the opening, the opening shot is we have a, a TV uh, presentation uh, talking about uh, the best food in the world coming from France and the best food in France coming from uh, uh, Paris. And a very clever anagram here. Um, Auguste Gusto, because if you actually pay attention to the letters, they're the same letters for both the surname and the first name, just switched around a little bit. So massive, so yeah. massive props, the um, massive props to the um, the screenwriter Brad Bird, who um, who like so he's the he's the sole screenwriter, but also helps with their directing uh, the film alongside um, the likes of uh, the the original. Uh, the original director, uh, 
uh, Jan Pinkova, but he was uh, replaced by Brad Bird uh, because uh, Pixar felt that he that Jan wasn't ready to be uh, a director at that at that point. But he did help with the story alongside uh, uh, Jim Capobianco, and some additional story material was provided by Emily Cook, Kathy Greenberg, and Bob Peterson. Uh, so, so that's so that's all the team helping with the, the writing and the directing, etc. Um, we we learn a bit about um, we learn a bit about uh, Gusto, who is voiced brilliantly by uh, Brad Garrett. Now, of course, uh, I'll say, uh, just to make things a little easier for myself, I'm actually operating from my phone regarding the IMDb um, uh, related stuff. Um, he's got a few Disney credits to his name. Uh, he's He's been in uh, Tangled. He was the voice of Eeyore in the 2018 Christopher Robin film, part of the Winnie the Pooh franchise. Um, it's a Tangled. Uh, Amphibia. Uh, Penny Dreadful uh, in uh, 2020. Uh, he was he would actually reprise his role of uh, Hook Hand in uh, the Tangled TV series. Um, and he would actually, in the same year Christopher Robin came out, he was also... Uh, Eeyore in Ralph Breaks the Internet, making a cameo appearance in the Oh My Disney section. And th- that whole scene in uh, Wreck-It Ralph is just filled with fan service just all over the place. Uh, Gloria Bell as uh, Dustin. Um, I'm dying up here in 2018 as well with um, as Roy Martin. Um, he was Roy Getman in Bull in uh, 2017. 2016, he had... Uh, he was the voice of Bloat in Finding Dory. Uh, he was part of the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles film Out of the Shadows in 2016 as Krang. Uh, he's been part of the Night of the Museum franchise, uh, Fargo, Planes, Fire and Rescue, uh, Clockwork Girl. Um, so I'm just going through. Uh, he's been part of Hoodwinked as well as, well, The Giant. Um, he's actually been part of the entire Night of the Museum uh, trilogy, uh, portraying a character from um, Easter Island. He was an underdog, another Disney project in 2007 as uh, Riff Raff. Um, music and lyrics as uh, Chris Riley uh, that same year as well. That one film, that film starring uh, Hugh Grant and Drew Barrymore. Uh, he's got he's got um, he's got a director video um, credit from Disney in the form of uh, Tarzan two as uh, Yuto in two thousand and five. He was he was the vice principal in the Pacifier that same year as well, starring uh, Vin Diesel. Uh, the voice of Luca in the um, in the Garfield in the Garfield Garfield film that year with. Uh, Bill Murray calling that film uh, one of his biggest regrets as a little uh, in joke in Zombieland. Uh, he was a commander in Jerry uh, Tom and Jerry Blast Off to Mars. Uh, so yeah, he's um, so yeah, he's been a pretty he's been a pretty busy bee as well. Uh, oh, and he's also been in Stuart Little as well as the um, as the plumber trying to find um, um, Mrs. Little's uh, ring. He was Big Mike in Kim Possible. Uh, talk in Buzz Lightyear of uh, Star Command. Uh, he was uh, in. Ta- he was Tank in the in the Goofy movie sequel, an extremely uh, Goofy movie. Uh, Orthus in the Hercules TV series Zero to Hero. Uh, he's got a couple of DC credits to his name as well, uh, mainly uh, Bibbo in a Superman uh, TV series. Uh, oh, he was dim in a Bug's Life as well. So. He's got plenty of Disney and Pixar credits to his name and the philosophy that Gusto has, and it's the title of his book as well, Anyone uh, Can Cook. However, Anton Ego, one of the most, uh, what's, what's the word? Look, one of the most, uh, um, disciplined? Yeah. What? T- tough, certainly. One of the toughest crit- food critics in all of Paris, Anton Ego, voiced by Peter O'Toole, uh, 
who's been in films Great like Nero Tool. Yes, uh, eight Oscar nominations uh, to his name, with films including but not limited to Lawrence of Arabia, Troy, Diamond Cartel, Decline of an Empire, Outlaws, um, Eager to Die, Dean Spanley. Uh, he was in the. He was also in the Tudors uh, TV series as well as Pope Paul the Third. He was in Stardust the same year Ratatouille. Uh, came out. Uh, there was a Lassie film he was in in 2005 as the Duke. Uh, Casanova that same year uh, as well. J.J. Curtis in The Final Curtain. Uh, Rock My World in 2002. Joan of Arc as, as Bishop Pierre in 1999. He was in an adap- adaptation of Gulliver's Travels in 1996, uh, King Ralph in 91, uh, a film called The Nutcracker Prince as Pantaloon in 1990, Wings of Fame that same year as well. So he's definitely he's definitely been going for a, for a while. Uh, he was in a he was in a Supergirl film as Zaltar in 1984. Uh, and he's even got a handful of animated Sherlock Holmes credits to his name as the titular detective himself. The Sign of Four, The Valley of Fear, A Study in Scarlet, and The Baskerville Curse. So very impressive there to get a very prestigious detective on his uh, on he's his also, resume. He was also in the... Uh... Uh, criminally underrated King Ralph with John Goodman and John Hurt. Ah, there we go, folks. So there's one. There's one to add to your watch list if you're a fan of their. If you're a fan of their work, uh, Peter O'Toole. He did. He has. Um, unfortunately, he has. Um, he has sadly passed away. But uh, he did live a very long life. He. Um, he passed away at the uh, ripe old age of uh, 81 back in December of uh, 2013. So. So overall, a very, a very lengthy career that he had. Um, so yeah. uh, and of course, Anton Ego ha- not believing in um, Gusto's uh, policy, uh, uh, philosophy of anyone can cook, saying not any, not everyone can, um, can be able to do so. Uh, and yes. one of one of his more critical reviews of uh, Gusto's restaurant resulted in them. Uh, the restaurant ended up losing one of its five stars down to four. And because of how heartbroken Gusto was, he ended up um, he ended up passing away not too long afterwards. And that ended up um, resulting in the loss of another star, both in the metaphorical sense that the restaurant was then down to three stars and then um, the star of arguably like one of the most famous chefs in all of Paris at the time. But um, that that TV presentation uh, is shown while we see while we have the um, um, the classic trope of um, well not necessarily with a record scratch in the background but um, the um, I was like uh, like the ac- a, action going on then suddenly something jumps out of the screen then it freezes freeze, freeze frame. And and then of course I'm, I'm actually I'll see if I can try and work this in in the editing process, folks, because it'll be a case. Uh, Remy jumps through the window, glass glass smashing, record scratch. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. So I'm, so, I'm, so I'm gonna see if I can get so if I can see if I I'll see if I can edit that particular shot in that particular manner but uh no there's no there's no guarantee there's no guarantees I'll be able to um uh perfect it but oh I'm gonna give it a good I'm gonna give it a good sporting try in the editing process folks and yeah, uh, you can but try absolutely so we have Remy of course uh he is he is the star himself voiced by Patton Oswald, who actually got the role thanks to Brad Bird listening to 
uh, a stand-up routine that Oswalt did on um, on a uh, on a, a steakhouse, um, something regarding steakhouses. Uh, if I can find it, so I've, I've definitely got it written down here uh, somewhere. Um, wherever, no, uh, I'll. I'll, I'll, I'll find it. I'll find it somewhere. But, but it was it was a stand up routine that Brad Bird listened to, uh, was watching, um, and uh, with how impressed he was with the routine, he decided, you know what, this guy is going to be our star. Now, now with now with a name like now with a name like uh, Patton Oswald, he doesn't look like he's it doesn't look like he's got uh, that many um, uh, credits to. Uh, uh, to his name, but he does have a primetime Emmy uh, to his name as well, alongside a few, alongside another handful of wins. Um, he's been in uh, like young adults, um, also uh, seeking a friend for the end of the world as Roach in uh, 2012, because for some bizarre reason, uh, 2012 seemed to be the year of uh, having uh, films associated with the end of the world due to the whole Mayan calendar thing. Uh <laughs> He's been part of the Star Trek series Picard in, just this year, in fact, as Spot 73. He's been in a Netflix TV series, uh, Netflix, uh, the Netflix series Mystery Science Theater 3000 as Max. Uh, Space, Space Force, uh, he was the narrator in The yep. Goldbergs. Uh, ah, he was Harry Baskin in Curb Your Enthusiasm. Uh, and... Well, lo and behold, even he's got a Family Guy credit to his name as Tyler. Uh, the same year Eternals came out just last year as Pip the Troll. Uh, now, for me, the Eternals is the weakest Marvel film that I've seen uh, so far, but um, I won't go into too much detail regarding that. Uh, he's, he's been on American Dad, Dad as well. Uh, he's been Modoc as well. Uh, even appeared on Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Uh, been in a, he was Mr. Sparkles in the uh, Big Hero Six TV series, uh, Mickey and the Roadster Races as well, uh, the Boys in uh, 2020, uh, Agents of Shield uh, as Billy Koenig, Will and Grace, the Priest. Um, he was in a, uh, he was in a How to Train Your, Tra he was in a How to Train Your Dragon uh, series as Olive uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, what else he's been in? Um, Super Gidget, he's been... Uh, he was Uncle Ben in a Spider-Man TV series between 2017 and 2019. Uh, Adams as uh, Roger, Veronica Mars. Uh, Teen Titans Go as uh, The Atom. He was Max in The Secret Life of Pets. He's even been part of the My Little Pony franchise as uh, Quibble Pants. Um... And uh, 2019, he ended up in the uh, Kim Possible uh, Disney Channel uh, film, which uh, I I, re I really enjoyed, given given the fact I'm a big uh, fan of the Kim Possible TV series. Uh, so definitely not bad going for him. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm glad I'm I'm glad you mentioned that he was in uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 because that's one of my favorite TV shows. It is. It is a glorious show. Yeah. So, so then, so then we get introduced to some more of the, um, some more of the, uh, uh, the rat crew. Uh, you've got, uh, right, uh, uh, Brian uh, uh, Denahy, I think that's how it's pronounced. De Denahy. Uh, uh, Denahy, thank you. As Django, who is uh, Remy's dad. Remy also has a brother, uh, Emil, voiced by uh, Peter Son. Now, Son was originally there just to do the scratch track for um, uh, for the character, but the Pixar team were so impressed with his scratch track they they decided to keep him on as the as the as the act as the voice actor for uh, the character. And the uh, the rat crew they 
Uh, they're looking. They're looking for food uh, outside. And, um, since since you um since you bring yeah. up the rats, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um. You'll say there is there is actually. Yeah, I was going to say since you um uh yeah since you br- oh so so go ahead sorry there's internet connection problems again Ugh. right um uh just like with um finding Nemo when they studied you know real life fish to get an idea of their movements they brought in cages of real live rats to examine the ways in which they moved and stood and held themselves. Then once they'd um, designed the characters, they sculpted the characters in order to get a good idea of the three-dimensional proportions they wanted to translate into the actual animation. And um, some good quotes I found here, one from uh, the production designer, Harley Jessup. He said, our goal was to make them actually cuddly. Or as um, supervising animator Mark Walsh said, we did a bit of research in what makes something cute. And they found, um, in particular, the positioning of rats' arms, you know, like this, to be mm-hmm. particularly adorable. You no, know, not down at their sides, but more in the center. They found that to be really, really sweet. Yeah. Uh, so there's a couple. There's a couple of other things regarding the uh, the rats as well. Uh, that uh, Remy, in particular, had 1.15 million hairs rendered onto his body. Whereas somebody like um, like Colette, for instance, one of the chefs at Gusto's Kitchen, uh, has only one hundred and fifteen thousand um, rendered. But but yeah, so um, but I say but just taking all that into account, the, you can definitely tell much like with um, Finding Nemo, which was the most recent Pixar film that uh, Alan covered, and the Pixar playlist you can find in the top right of your screens. Uh, as well, uh, so so that we so you can go through the uh, the Pixar films that we've covered uh, so far. Um, so uh, they're about to, so the rat crew are about to eat a, a couple of things, and then Remy, with his heightened sense of uh, smell, ends up um, picking out that some of the uh, garbage has has actually got rat poison on it as well. And uh, Django decides to get Remy to put this to use by checking everything the rats find. And uh, as you can as you can tell from um, as you can tell from uh, the way Remy's sitting, he's definitely not impressed that he's having to use his um, unique abilities for something that doesn't involve cooking because that's his goal to become a sh- to become a cook in Paris. Uh, so then next up we uh, so, we've, so we've so we've had all the uh, the TV presentations that we mentioned um, and then and then the old lady uh, the old lady she ends up um, she ends up getting her shotgun out after comically opening opening up the umbrella thinking it was the uh, the shotgun uh, but you got to think how many shells were in that shotgun before she had to reload <laughs> enough for just such an occasion yeah but uh, and, it, and it turns out the uh, the rat clan have been living in her s- in her ceiling the whole time, she ends up shooting the ceiling down, and the entire the entire the entire group just like scurry on, uh, just scurry on out. Uh, Remy left behind because he is more concerned about getting uh, Gusto's book. Uh, so yeah, not not only not only did um, the old lady have the uh, the shotgun, but she also had. Uh, some gas, hence why she's got the gas mask on to try and wipe out the rats. Uh, she's unfortunately, uh, unfortunately for her anyway, unsuccessful in her uh, vain attempts to try and uh, exterminate the rats. Because uh, the rats managed to escape under uh, under a bridge into a into a tunnel. Uh, but Remy, unfortunately not able to uh, catch up he gets swept away and he's st- he's stuck in a sewer for a while um with the 
um, with Gusto appearing as the figment of his imagination throughout the film uh, to give him the drive that he needs to keep going with pursuing his goal. And as it turns out, the rats have been living under Paris the whole time. And the fact that we, and, and, and this, there's no other word for it. The, the shot that we see of Paris at night, it just, there's just something a bit more special about those sort of nighttime shots. They just, yeah. they, they just look absolutely fantastic, especially, especially yeah. uh, lit up at night. Yeah, it really goes to show why Paris is known as the city of lights. Oh, abs- absolutely. And it's uh, definitely somewhere, definitely somewhere I definitely wouldn't mind uh, visiting at some point uh, mm-hmm. later down the road. But uh, but we'll we'll cross that bridge. We'll cross that bridge when we um, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So, um, Swemi, so Swemi's so so uh, like on the roof of uh, Gusto's uh, restaurant at this point, and uh, and we get introduced to the rest of the we get introduced to the rest of the uh, uh, the chefs that are in before uh, in, um, in the kitchen before you get. So I'll, I'll just quickly mention one thing. One uh-huh. thing I absolutely love about this movie is that, like, there's a bit where um, Remy is uh, scuttling along the sewers and passing, like, various uh, houses and buildings and seeing all the people who are inside. All of them have got something going on. You know, I love how each and every one of just the extras have their own little separate story going on to the, the point where you could almost make a Pulp Fiction style movie just from all of the stuff that these extras are going through. I love it. That's that's, that's actually very well, that's very well spotted. Uh, Somebody there with a a keen eye for detail for things, for things like that. Um, So it's, so we're heading, so it's like, so into the kitchen, we're going to, we're going to introduce you to the rest of the the rest of the crew. You've got um, uh, Janine, a, Garofalo as Colette, Will Arnett as uh, Horst. Uh, Will Arnett, uh, for the Lego fans out there, will know him best as, of course, the Caped Crusader himself, Batman in the uh, the Lego the Lego movies and his own Lego Batman movie uh, as well. Uh, Julius uh, Callahan as uh, Lalo Stroke Francois. Um, uh, James Remar as uh, La Russe. Uh, then we've also got um, Ian Holm as, um, as Skinner. And, oh boy, Skinner just comes across as really detestable throughout the entirety of this film. Apparently he was the character that they had the most fun animating. Yeah, and you and we'll definitely we'll definitely get into some of that um, later on. Um, there's one of his most well known roles in terms of Middle Earth fans is the is of course portraying Bilbo Baggins in both the Lord of the Rings trilogy and an older uh, Bilbo in the Hobbit trilogy, despite the fact the Hobbit trilogy is a prequel to the Lord of the Rings, but I digress. Uh, He portrayed Ash in the Alien video game, Alien Isolation, uh, 1066 as well, O Jerusalem, The Treatment, Renaissance, Lord of War. Uh, He was in The Aviator as Professor Fitz alongside uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, The Day After Tomorrow as Terry Raps in that same year. Uh, as well he was the narrator in the new detectives in uh, 2002 Uh, he was sir william gull in from hell in 2001 and he was also napoleon in the emperor's new clothes that same year as well the narrator in secret agent uh bless the child in 2000 as well beautiful joe uh the holocaust on trial uh, the Miracle Maker. Um, now, I think 
I think we might have mentioned this one previously that there was uh, he was in an animal farm adaptation in 1999 as Squealer. Now, I'm right. saying, I say, I say, judge it by, judge it by you nodding your head there. Yeah, we have mentioned this one previously. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a sure. great adaptation. Yeah, so I'm, so I'm trying to say, uh, what, what were the names that you mentioned in this adaptation? Uh, Patrick Stewart as Napoleon. Of course, yes. And Kel- and Kelsey Grammer as Snowball. Ah, yeah, there, there we go, folks. So there's that. Um, uh, Sugar in uh, 1999 as well. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. Uh, he, was in, he was in an adaptation of Alice Through the Looking Glass in 1998 as the White Knight. And... Um, he was also in. He was also in the fairly bizarre, to say the least, Fifth Element in 1998 as well. Incognito uh, in. Ni- oh no! Wait, hang on. No, he was Cornelius in uh, the Fifth Element in 1997. Uh, same year, Incognito uh, came out. Uh, Pascal in the Big Night in 1996, and ah, yeah, he is. Here's one a lot of people will be familiar with. Uh, the Madness of King George as Willis in yep. 1994. The same year, he was Victor's father in an adaptation of um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. He was also the tailor in the world of Peter Rabbit and Friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was also Pod in The Borrowers in 1992. So I said there's been several adaptations of the borrowers over the years. And the one in 1992 looks like that was the one that was uh, that starred uh, John Goodman. Uh, he's bit he's he's got a, he's got a Shakespeare credit to his name uh, as well as uh, uh, Polonius in Hamlet in 1990 as well. Uh, Chillers that same year as well. Henry the Fifth. In 1989, uh, he was Bernard in a game set and match in 1988. Uh, he was he was in Murder by the Book, which was a TV, um, which was a TV adaptation of uh, one of Agatha Christie's Hercule Poirot uh, uh, books. Um, another credit I've just spotted as well, judging by the poster. Um, Simone Vise in 2005, uh, Lord of War, and from the poster, it's also got Nicolas Cage in it as well. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say this right now. Um, so, Anton Ego and uh, Skinner. Anton Ego comes across to me as the antagonist of the film, not a full blown villain. Whereas Skinner, that's the villain of the film to me, anyway. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. But yeah, that's that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah, and you've got Lou Romano as the voice of uh, Linguini. Uh, he was also Bernie Crop in The Incredibles, Snotrot in Cars. He was in the live action uh, remake of Dumbo in uh, twenty. 20- well, he was involved with the um, a live action remake of uh, Dumbo in the arts department. Uh, he's also got a primetime Emmy to his name as well. That being for Outstanding Individual Achievement in Animation for Episode XCV. And um, what, what TV series are here, you ask? Samurai Jack, arguably one of the greatest shows made for Cartoon uh, Network. He's got a few, and he's mm-hmm. got a couple of Annie Awards. Uh, not, he's got an Annie nomination and an Annie win uh, as well. Now, I mentioned previously, the Annie Awards are basically the Oscars for animation. Uh, Le Petit Prince in 2015 uh, for outstanding achievement in production design in an animated feature production, but he would actually win in production design in an animated feature production in 2005 for The Incredibles. Uh, He was nominated for two Art Directors Guild Awards, one for for Dumbo and one for The Incredibles. So it's not the first time that we have had 
a member of the animation team or like a member of the crew in general uh, provide their voice for uh, a Pixar film. I say it's not the first time we've seen that. We've seen the likes of uh, Andrew Stanton and even Brad Bird himself provide their voice for various characters over the years with um, uh, with Pixar. Uh, and then we get to Mustafa. Now, right now, at this point, we all know, we all know that there's one name that is at this point synonymous with Pixar. I'll give you guys, I'll give you guys five seconds to work out who it is. Yep, John Ratzenberger. But this is one of his, one of his uh, more less recognizable roles, mainly for the fact that he's able to, he's able to pull off a phenomenal French accent, might I add. Oh yeah. So, yeah. Um, so we get, so, so Linguini is there as the garbage boy. And, and then and he decides, he decides, hmm, let's see if we can make some adjustments to this soup. And uh, yeah, judged by the fact he ends up uh, throwing up shortly afterwards, yeah, it does not go well. But um, uh, but Remy, being the genius that he is with creating all these flavor combinations, and you actually see that uh, uh, earlier on, where he takes a bite of the cheese and he takes a bite of the strawberry and then combines the two together and crafts absolute magic. And the animation, the animation oh, with the black beautiful. background looks amazing. It's so good. Such a great way of illustrating what's going on in that scene. Oh, oh, definitely. And uh, he, he does, he does, he tries the same trick with uh, Emile uh, later on in the film, but not quite to the same, not quite to the same success. Um. But that being that being said, though Remy does manage to fix the soup, uh, and then the soup ends up being dished up because uh, a uh, linguini thinking at this point uh, the soup still mixed messed up like he's, the, the soup, and then Skinner. See, one thing I did pick up as well on regarding Skinner, not only with like you said with them, um, uh, the team having the most fun animating. Uh, Skinner, he does tend to be the butt of a majority of the jokes in this film. <gasps> He's just stop that soap and just shouting no as he bursts through the door and the entire restaurant goes silent and you're just like, well, this is embarrassing. I mean, just testament to how incredible Brad Bird's directing is and it's about it's about time I actually it's about time I actually got round to this. The genius of Michael Giacchino with the music in this film. It's one of the best soundtracks that's been that uh, that he's been involved with. I mean, a lot of a lot of the. I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail regarding the uh, the soundtrack in the. Uh, in, in the scores at the end of the um, of the episode, but like I said, uh, just in a, in a nutshell, he manages to match the music to every single beat of the story, and it, it it just takes someone incredibly special to be able to pull something like that off. And I was saying, and Giacchino is just not not really much, not really much else I can say beyond that at the moment. But um, yeah, so yeah, um, so yeah, Alan, Alan, hopefully trying to get his uh, uh, issues uh, fixed. But, um, but yeah, as, as I was saying before, he had to uh, uh, head off briefly to try and get the issues fixed. Uh, I see the genius of Giacchino with his um, with the music in this film, being able to match it to every single story beat throughout the yeah. film. It, it, it takes it takes somebody with a unique skill like Giacchino. To be able to pull something like like that off to the level that he did, but of course, yeah, but of course he is a master film composer. 
Oh, definitely. And that's one of the reasons why now he's like one of the go-to guys for uh, film uh, film composing for not just Pixar, but for Disney uh, especially. And don't worry, folks, his name's on the Legends yeah. of... His name's on his the... Score. His name is on the Disney Legends uh, list. So when we get round to doing the Legends of Disney series here in the Kingdom of Isolation, his name is definitely going to have an episode dedicated to how incredible his work is. And uh, not, yep. only, not only will we be covering the projects that he's been involved with with Disney and Pixar, but we'll also touch on the projects that he's, he's been involved with elsewhere. Like the Batman. Yes. Which I did finally get round to seeing last week. And... There was there was a there was a couple of the uh, there was a couple of the cinema uh, the cinema staff there that they said that the uh, the film gave them uh, 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 vibes that resembled uh, the Arkham games because because of the uh, detective elements throughout the film. Yeah, I can see that. I can definitely see that. No, so if if you guys haven't had a chance to see it yet, yeah, definitely go in there uh, see it. Uh, uh, but also at the same time, good... yeah. Def, it's definitely up there as one of the best Batman films that's been made. Um, but not just that, folks. Definitely get yourself to see Sonic 2 as well and stay behind for the post credit scene. And I'll leave it at that because I just went to see it earlier today. But, um, but, it, but it turns out um, one of the customers is, lo and behold, a critic who likes the soup. And everybody's like, wait, what? We have a critic who likes the soup and they want to speak to Linguini regarding it. The, paper, the review ends up in the papers the following day. And uh, yeah, sounds like, sounds like the Gusto restaurant are starting to get back on their feet after the, um, after the escapades of the, uh, the previous night. So... Uh, after that, sous chef, da, 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 anyone can cook. Yeah, uh, and of course, tying into tying into what um, Colette said um, in in that whole fiasco, that uh, the philosophy of uh, Gusto, which Skinner is clearly not a fan of. Uh, so, in a way, the Skinner was definitely jealous of the success that Gusto had uh, accumulated over the course of his career. Um, but, uh, and again, the philosophy that uh, the Gusto had that anyone, that anyone can cook. And yeah, just, and it, 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 works, it works in the film's favor here at this point in the film, especially because it turns, because in reality, it was Remy that managed to fix the soup, but it's Linguini that takes the, the it's Linguini that takes the credit for the for the time being because um there's there's a there's a pretty major twist in this film that we that we'll get into uh when we get to that point in the film and it uh, it definitely yeah. catch and I'll, it definitely catches people off guard I'll say that yeah but not only that but um is you know Linguini's taking credit at this moment in time because who on earth would ever believe that a rat can create this great soup, you know? Especially at this early stage, especially in this early stage in the film. Yeah. And, uh, I was like, and you can definitely tell that Skinner just really hates Linguini even more than he already does. Uh, mm -hmm. But, he, but he, tr he, tries to, he tries to be nice at the same time, but in a very antagonistic way. Take as long as you need, all week if you must. But you must recreate the soup. So yeah, no pressure then. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if anything, I'd be pretty intimidated by the, I'd be pretty pretty intimidated by yes, can at this point as well. So yeah, Linguini, I don't blame you for being as intimidated as you are. Um so uh let's so let's see whereabouts we are. Uh, we need anyone can cook. Demands replicate the soup. Spots for the. Uh, and this is one of the this is one of the running gags throughout this film, where we have, um, where we've got uh, Skinner convinced that he sees Remy 
in the kitchen and like around the restaurant where and so I say, looks around sees sees Remy uh, Alan can't seem to be Alan can't seem to catch a break with his internet at the moment so it's not the first time we've had to deal with this but anyway um, so right, so hopefully so hopefully third time's the charm yeah yeah, so we so we can't seem to, can't seem to catch a break with technical issues at the moment. But uh, anyway, um, nah. But um, I say I say I say one of the, I say a running gag throughout the film. Uh, Skinner convinced that he can see he that he sees Remy throughout um, in the kitchen or outside the restaurant. Uh, looks sees Remy briefly, uh, turns turns away, and then wait what? And then Re- and then Remy's gone. You know, he's convinced throughout the throughout the film's runtime that he can see a rat in the kitchen, and you're just like, mm. <laughs> and it, I say, I say he's he's trying to convince everybody that yeah, I'm not going crazy. I did legitimately see a rat here in the kitchen, and yeah, he's yeah, he's he's def he's definitely can. He, he just he is determined to take control of not just uh, Gusto's uh, restaurant, but at the same time, uh, we see him uh, we see him uh, having this idea of like doing these um, this frozen food line with various uh, food products from uh, across the world and um, tr- trying to trying to pass that off as the philosophy of uh, anyone can cook when reality is just a case of uh, taking it out the freezer, putting it in the oven, and there you go, a nice quick meal rather than making it from scratch. Mm. Speaking of um, the food, by the way, uh, when I was doing um, my research, I found that uh, for the food angle of the movie, they worked with um, famous American chef Thomas Keller, who uh, has a very similar philosophy to Gusto? He said, "Anybody can cook. It's just you have to have the desire, the determination to make something that you're going to feel proud to give to somebody. Have that emotional connection with somebody." Indeed, and um, and that and that actually t- that actually ties into um, something that something that I found doing doing my research. So I say sim- similar point to yours, where um, where the animators actually took cooking lessons and they actually cooked alongside uh, Thomas Keller uh, when uh, doing their research. And the animators actually consulted uh, gourmet chefs um, as well. Uh, And one of the things that some of the team did, um, Brad Bird and producer Bradford Lewis and some of the crew went to Paris for a week to get a feel for the city. And that included things like taking a motorcycle tour around the capital and eating at some of the top restaurants in uh, in the city and uh, so yeah the, i mean this is de- this is definitely one of the, i would say this definitely one of the perks of uh, being being able to uh, do stuff like this you get to be able to do this research and in in the case of ratatouille here being able to um being able to experience the finest some of the finest cuisine uh, in the world yeah yeah so give us all a bit of that <laughs> yeah I'd, yeah i'll say all the more reason for me to visit paris at some point later down the road thing is to go to a restaurant like that you would definitely need to save up a fair bit of cash for it but oh, um yeah. I, I i reckon it i reckon it would be worth it in the end so so um so then Linguini and Remy start to bond uh, throughout throughout the film, and Remy quite quite cleverly. Uh, so they're hiding under the. Um, so there, there's def- there's definitely a proper name for the, uh, uh, the the hat that they wear. There's there's definitely a proper name for it. I can't. I, can't I think put- they, they they call it something like um, a a toque, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it, it, it'll, be, it'll be something along those lines. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty sure it's something along those lines. So uh, having Remy underneath 
uh, the toga, but he's pulling Remy's hair, uh, Linguini's hair, sorry, um, to like control uh, his, um, to control his body movements. And this, this is def- this is definitely one of the, um, this is definitely one of the more, um, um, this is definitely one of the more clever ways of being able to uh, animate uh, an- animate the characters throughout throughout this film. Uh, having uh, it's, it's it's as if it's as if in a way it's as if Remy's an animator himself in in a sense using using the hair to be able to control the movements of uh, Linguini and the yeah. animators having a lot of fun being able to uh, anim- animate those um, animate those sequences, be it in um, Linguini's uh, apartment or in the kitchen itself. And I did a quick um, Google search there. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is called a toke. Yeah, there we go. So, and um, and and the incredible thing is they're having to try and keep they're having to try and make the movements convincing, while at the same time uh, not giving the secrets away of how Linguini is able to cook as well as he does. So. So there's that uh, as well. Um, so yeah, it's it's a case of effectively Remy controlling Linguini, like he's uh, uh, like Linguini is a marionette, uh, if you will, basically. Yeah, and uh, and talking of marionettes, uh, there's a live action remake of Pinocchio coming up uh, later this year. Now I'm not because I'm not 100 percent certain as to whether it's going to be going straight to Disney Plus or whether it's going to be. Uh, released in cinemas, but Tom Hanks as uh, Geppetto, and uh, so we've actually we've actually got the first uh, we've actually got the first screenshots of of the film, and the bi- the biggest thing I can praise praise the, uh, the first look for right out the gate is how the um, how the Disney crew paid very close attention to de- to detail to effectively perfectly recreate. The Pinocchio puppets, even everything from everything from the clothes to even even the even the feather in his hat as well, just the just the close attention to detail. Now, Pinocchio was one of my Pinocchio was one of my favorite um, uh, Disney films uh, growing up, and uh, so yeah, uh, and given the fact that you've got Tom Hanks as well, uh, so yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to um, definitely looking forward to seeing this when it. Um, uh, when it comes out, I said, I'll see if I can double. Mm-hmm. I'll see if I can double check if it is going straight to Disney Plus. I mean, the fact that you've got the likes of um, the fact that you've got Robert Zemeckis directing the film, the director of uh, the Back to the Future trilogy, and you've got the likes of um, uh, Jason Gordon Levitt and Luke Evans on board as well, and Alan Silvestri helping with the music as well. Uh, and yeah, it says there that it's going straight to Disney Plus, scheduled for a September release. So who knows? This remake could end up being in my top ten films of the year. But um, maybe, maybe so. But we'll uh, but we'll we'll cross that we'll cross that bridge when we um, yeah, when we get to it. Back to Ratatouille. Um, uh, meanwhile, um, times times going on and. Uh, Colette has been Colette's acts have been put uh, in charge of uh, supervising uh, Linguini while they try and recreate the soup. Um, they managed to recreate it successfully. Um, the Gusto's restaurant starting to regain its uh, popularity, and Ling- Linguini and Colette are starting to spend a fair bit of time together, both in the kitchen and away from the kitchen at the same time. So yeah. Uh, doesn't take uh, doesn't take uh, Sherlock Holmes to fill in the blanks on this one that a romance is starting to develop between the two, but the great thing here is that, especially in this day and age, compared to like yeah your classic fairy tales of like your Snow White, your Sleeping Beauties, your Little Mermaids, where you have where you have the uh, you have the princess and the prince uh, falling for each other almost immediately, getting married a few days later. Um, this relationship builds up over the course you know, over the course of the film, 
much 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 akin to like much akin to uh, Beauty and the Beast as well. Although things start a bit uh, start with a bit of tension between Belle and Beast um, at the start, but then the relationship starts to grow over the, over time, and then. And then, of course, the ballroom scene, that sweeping camera shot, um, Beast letting Belle go to, uh, to, um, to try and save her dad, uh, Maurice. There's a, bit of, there's a bit of tension with um, Colette and Linguini as well, where um, when she learns she's going to be supervising him, she just, like, gives him the talk down, like, you know, like, laying down the law, basically. Yeah. But... Um... Yeah, but uh, but but like I said, I see the, the tension starts to ease, and they're starting to enjoy spending more time together. And um, Remy's starting to get a little bit jealous at this point, where um, uh, where Linguini is uh, taking more of Colette's advice in terms of um, cooking rather than getting uh, Remy's uh, opinion on what to put into the dishes. Mm. And when we get to um when we, when we get to see Anton Ego, uh his room, interestingly, is shaped like a coffin. <laughs> which which uh, which ties into the um which ties into the uh, the fact that he writes killer reviews, if yeah. you will. And- and I especially love the fact that um, the back of his typewriter kind of looks like a skull. Yes, there is that as well. Now, of course, we can't go through a Pixar film without pointing out some of the Easter eggs that uh, pop up throughout the film. So we'll go into the more we'll go into the um, we'll go into the we'll go into the more obscure uh, Easter eggs. Uh, if you will, uh, one of them being the restaurant having a caviar brand named Nemo, referencing Finding Nemo. <laughs> um, they've also, I say, they've also got uh, a cameo uh, from um, uh, from a character from The Incredibles later on in the film uh, Bon Voyage. Um, so, so you've got those two uh, little Easter eggs, but. Of course, you guys are wondering where's Pizza Planet Truck and where's A113. So let's see if we can source where they were. So um, so the A113, of course, uh, that of course tying in to uh, the, uh, the classroom that John Lester has at the... Um, at the uh, the Cal Arts uh, School, um, there's actually, and it turns out, it's actually a tag on um, on one of the uh, the rat's ears that uh, that has the uh, A113 uh, on it. So uh, let's see, rat's two, yes. Uh, and there's there's actually there's actually two A113s in this film, much like at um much like in the uh, the incredibles because you've got two a113 references there one being the uh, the conference room uh, a113 and then you've got um level a1 and then uh, cell 13 uh, but here uh, the um uh, G, uh, G, uh, G, uh, so I'm, so I'm, I'm going to pronounce it as that uh, git uh, is a lab rat uh, has a tag on his left ear that reads A113, but uh, with uh, Linguini also watching TV at one point in the film, uh, there's a, an, an A113 uh, appearing on the train behind a love couple. So I love, I love, see, that's that's what I mean about the um, stories, like the movie within the movie. I want to see the rest of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... So, yeah, so, so there you go, folks. So that's the A113s out of the way. But where's the Pizza Planet truck? We're just about to get into that because it turns out that uh, it's not like revealed publicly until towards the end of the film that Linguini is actually the son of Gusto. Say what? 
And Skinner's reaction when he finds this news out is just like, are you kidding me? This garbage boy is the son of Gusto, despite no resemblance. Get my lawyer. And he actually finds this out from a letter that's from uh, Linguini's um, mother who had passed away uh, off screen. So, but like I say, it's, it's just the reaction from it. And then, of course, the reaction from, uh, the reaction from Remy uh, as well. You so see, just, like be- so just like cutting between what's on the paper and cutting to his, re- seeing the reaction, seeing the reactions from him as well. Just, yeah, we're, 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 on the, we're all on the same boat here, not just with Skinner, but also Remy's reaction as well, finding out, wait, hang on. I've been, I've been, helping the son of Gusto. And so there's that. Uh, and then Skinner officially finds uh, Remy in his office. And uh, Remy decides, right, okay, yeet, takes the, um, takes the official documents away, including the letter from Ed Linguini's mother. And then we have a very well very well animated uh, chase sequence, mm-hmm. and it's you know, it's just the pacing throughout this film as well is simply fantastic. Let's see, just let's see, just having the, the fast pace of uh, following uh, following Remy through, and then you've got this chase sequence, and then things slowing down a little bit. Uh, but of course, like I said, a lot of the fast paced stuff involves Remy. And being in the kitchen because the kitchen is a very, um, a, a very frantic environment at the best of times, especially when you're overloaded uh, with orders. Um, look, one of the one of the best things about the um, so what, so what, one of the best things we uh, we find in terms of uh, uh, some, some some comedy, if you will, uh, is Colette telling. Linguini about the all the chefs that are in the um that are in the kitchen, and it's Horst that is just hilarious with his uh, backstory because he's supposedly done time, but ev- but he ends up changing his story as to why he served time, ev- all the time, and just <laughs> the best one has to be that he supposedly killed a man with this thumb and, and you actually see the close-up of the thumb and it's just that that's that's probably his best line throughout the film oh I mean, yeah i mean i mean you're not you're not sure you're not sure whether to believe him or not that he did legitimately kill a man with just his thumb <laughs> Honestly, again, that's the genius of the writing from uh, Brad Bird and those that helped with the story uh, as well. Um, so, but of course, back to the back to the chase between Skinner and uh, Remy. Um, this is where we see the Pizza Planet truck. Right. Yes. So uh, the Pizza Planet, the Pizza Planet truck appears in the. Um, background uh if i can find it uh and i don't have it written down in my notes on here uh so back to the ever faithful uh internet uh peter black here we go da, 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 da. Uh, and so, so what I'll, do is I'll actually put a screenshot up now and uh yeah that's where the peter planet truck um uh, shows up. Uh, the pizza truck, pizza planet truck, can be seen cruising through the streets of Paris, um, with the truck being in the far back left, crossing the bridge as Skinner chases uh, Remy through the streets. So, and then it all climaxes with uh, Skinner and Remy uh, jumping between boats, and then the uh, the paper that Remy's carrying acts as sort of like um, a glider. For him to get onto the next boat to try and get back onto back onto land, Skinner tries to Skinner tries to make it as well, 
but unfortunately, he's unsuccessful. But um, I say, and uh, he'll say, if I was like, if you've got a keen eye for detail and you're actually paying attention, you can actually see he tries to grab onto the table cover and he pulls off the. Uh, he manages to pull off the table cover trick of just like yanking it off and everything staying in place. <laughs> it, I'll say, I'll say, now, it, that's, that's something I'm not even going to dare to try anytime oh, yeah. soon. No, no. But uh, I'll say, I'll say, it's just the fact you have to pull it with such force that, that you're pulling it as quickly as you, you can. You pull it so quickly that Every that's um, that I say the tablecloth comes off, but everything staying in place. And I say, not many people, not many people are able to, not many people are able to pull that one off. But um, but when you, but when you see it happen, you're just like, I need to learn. You, you, you're gonna instantly think, yeah, I need to learn how to try this. Yeah, because it looks so cool. Oh, de- definitely, yeah. Um, but that being said, uh, Skinner is completely soaked and um he ends up um he ends up getting back to the restaurant like completely soaking wet uh and he ends up being uh effectively sacked from the restaurant because uh, the rest of the kitchen have now found out that linguini is the heir to uh gusto's uh, kitchen uh in in the will as well, uh, and th- and this is all with a few days left before the deadline, because if no heir was found, then the then the will states that the kitchen and the restaurant would go to Gusto's sous chef, which turns out to be Skinner. So try as Skinner might, he tries to uh, expose. Um, Remy to uh, the rest of the uh, kitchen staff, but without any success. And he's, he's just disguised the entire time with his beret, the sunglasses, and this uh, this oversized um, uh, raincoat uh, while reading the while reading the paper with with every headline being all about Linguini and the restaurant and. And this whole thing, when, when he's ever sneaking about, leads to one of the best visual gags in the whole movie and a great mm-hmm. payoff to a previous joke where um, Skinner is looking, peeping through a window and Horst comes up behind him and goes... And then we, <laughs> yes. then we go... <laughs> yeah, he, he, gets, he gets tossed off the ground. He gets tossed off the we restaurant don't, we, don't, we don't see how, but we can only assume he somehow did it. With, with his thumb, thumb. yes. <laughs> was it just so probably something like uh, just like just like lifting him up by the jacket and then just going Zoof! bye. Maybe either way, that is a great payoff and a great visual gag. Oh yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's again testament to how brilliant the writing is in this film. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm sitting here. And we're, we're about like halfway to two thirds of the way through the film. And I'm struggling to find any faults with this film. Yeah, honestly, same. Yeah. So with the popular popularity skyrocketing and then the media appearances from Linguini, um, talking about uh, how he's, talking about he's the heir to the, the restaurant. And then everything falls silent when Anton Ego walks into the room and yeah very intimidating just from the black suit the tall slim intimidating figure and even some of the camera shots just yeah just showing him as intimidating as he can possibly be but what really sells it is peter o'toole's rumbling voice oh absolutely yes and yeah, just um, I'm not entirely sure whether to call it uh, an innuendo or not, but uh, there there are a couple of innuendos here and there throughout the film. But that I mean, being... like it's it can be interpreted as an innuendo, but taken it, but 
you're not really you're supposed to take it at face value you know yes <laughs> yes because he just doesn't he doesn't like food he loves it and if i don't love it i don't swallow Anybody that has something like that aimed at them would be just as intimidated as Linguini is at this point. Because, yeah, again, this is one of the top food critics in all of Paris. Yeah. And like the idea that if he doesn't like what he's tasting, he won't even let it contaminate his stomach. Yes. And then... And and then uh, Anton says that he is going to come back the following day to um, to talk uh, to have his meal. Um, and I love the way he his exit line. <laughs> I will return tomorrow evening with high expectations. Pray you don't disappoint me. It's like like is is this Anton Ego or Darth Vader? What's this? exactly exactly yeah. Let's say. <laughs> But again, there's a massive props to Peter O'Toole to be able to mm -hmm. portray such an intimidating character in such an incredible uh, fashion. But there's one line um, in particular. I saw a um, behind the scenes uh, recording of this line uh -huh. where, um, where he's looking over his uh, original review of Gusto's and uh, the line, um, as Peter O'Toole originally said it was... Um, Gusto has found his rightful place in history alongside another equally famous chef, Monsieur Boyardee. Uh, mm -hmm. But the director said, all right, um, try that line again. But on the final line, I want you to stab the knife and twist it. And so he changed it to <laughs> another equally famous chef. Oh, you're, you're breaking up a little bit there. Yeah. Oh, right. Right. Uh, yeah, and so he says now. he says the line. Yeah, so he says the line. Another equally famous chef, Monsieur Boyard. <laughs> Ouch! Yeah, yeah. Stab the knife and twist it. Yeah, he certainly did that and the rest. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then and then Linguini ends up having a nightmare where he ends up being uh, the waiter for uh, Gusto so uh, uh, what would you is there any are you ready to order yes I would like your heart roasted on a spit <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but uh, we we get we get to the big day itself with uh, Anton visiting uh, the restaurant. He um he ha he has his he has his soup as his um, starter as and um it's, uh, a case of uh, taking as much time uh, taking as much time as um uh, the kitchen needs to be able to uh, prepare something. But the issue here is that uh, the kitchen staff don't exactly know what to cook, and then the and then the secret get and then the secret gets out. Um, you're saying Linguini explains how it all works, and the e Remy giving the demonstration, yeah. and, and and I love how none of the none of the other chefs say anything but you can tell that they're all thinking the same thing yeah exactly i mean just and again much like much like a couple of scenes that i've talked about previously here especially the mulan especially through the mulan episode where all that's there is the story of that particular moment the visuals with what the cap with how the characters have expressed expressing themselves and the music in the background no dialogue and that just makes this scene all the more powerful i mean even even colette right at the end goes to effectively slap linguini in the face and just walks off and and just starts riding on her bike mm -hmm. 
But um, you don't need a single line of dialogue to to perfectly understand what everyone is thinking and feeling in that moment. Yeah, they they feel like they've been cheated, effectively. That it's been Remy the whole time, rather than Linguini himself. Mm. But, um, but it's but it's when. It's when Colette is waiting at the waiting at the light. She looks to she looks to her right, a bookstore, and on the on the window in the window, Gusto's book. Anyone can cook, and then the team decide to come back, and Remy get Remy gets everybody to their uh, appropriate stations. Some helping with the um, some helping with the vegetables, some helping with uh, the soup. Uh, so everybody's got their own role. Everybody's got their own role to carry out in the kitchen, to be able to to be able to cook up the um, uh, the meals for the uh, the customers and especially for um uh, for An- uh, for Anton Ego. And uh, what dish are they cooking this evening, folks? The title of the film itself, Ratatouille. Now, the funny thing with the uh, the title itself is that there was a bit of concern as to whether as as to how the British how the general public would be able to pronounce the film. So what they did on one of the posters here, they actually have how it sounds phonetically underneath the title. So yeah, that is a very clever thing. Yeah. So so big props, big props to the marketing, big props to the marketing team for being able to uh, pull such a thing. However, there was a little bit of um. There was a bit of trouble with the marketing department. They had a bit of trouble trying to get the film uh, marketed. There was one point where they were trying to get uh, a wine um, that would have Remy on the um, on the label, and it would be sold in uh, Costco stores. Uh, but there was a bit of concern from the companies involved that um, that given the fact that you've got effectively a cartoon character on the label. There would be the concern that it would end up leading to a significant rise in underage drinking. So that plan got so that plan got um, uh, shelved very quickly. Yeah, uh, understandably so. But the thing, the thing as well is that not not a lot of companies would want to work would not want to have um, a, a lot of food companies, especially they didn't exactly want to be promoting. Um, a film that involved uh, that involved a rat, uh, effectively because we because of, mainly for the reputation that rats normally have as um, as vermin in like any sort of um, environment. Yeah, but um, as as we'll see when we get to the um, uh, the scores, it uh, c- certainly didn't affect how uh, how well the uh, the film performed. Oh no. And um, speaking of the uh, ratatouille itself, something interesting I found out, mm-hmm. it's um, a very specific type of ratatouille. It's a variant called uh, Confit Bialdi, and I probably butchered the pronunciation. Okay. Um, but it was uh, developed for the film by Thomas Keller, who adapted a ratatouille recipe by French chef Michel Gerard. Again, probably butchered the pronunciation. Oh. Um, okay, and uh, the name for it, the confit bialdi, is a uh, play on the Turkish dish imam bialdi or stuffed eggplant. And of course, egg eggplant is one of the uh, the vegetables that is used in the ratatouille dish itself. Mm-hmm. That's, it. That's it. Now, I've act- I've actually tried ratatouille on on a couple of occasions, and uh, yeah, I I, I, thought, I thoroughly uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it myself. Um, so. Uh, I see. I see the, the way. I see the way it's being prepared, and the way they're putting it into the um, uh, the, uh, the cooking dish for putting it into the uh, the oven to uh, to cook. It's actually it's vegetable slices, and and they've got, and they've got you got you've got a bit of parchment paper um uh, over the top. Uh, put it in the oven, all good to go. And then you've got like a, a portion of you've got like a, a small uh, tower of the vegetable slices uh, as your portion, and then you've got the sauce to go. Uh, around it and then some of the sauce going on the top uh, and while all that's happening you've got um uh, linguini coming in and out of the kitchen on roller skates uh 
uh, topping up the drinks, helping with their like serving the um, serving the dishes, getting the menus out. Uh, all all with once again Giacchino's fantastic score in the um, mm-hmm. uh, in the background. Uh, th- there is there is another song uh, beforehand. Um, so I think it's the only song in the film. Um, it is go back up to my film notes. It is uh, uh, La Fest La Festi um, F E S T I N because because uh, with with the like with French being language, uh, the last letter is normally um, uh, silent. Um, to me, that song, pers- that song is just phenomenal for how it personifies um, how it personifies uh, the film. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a beautiful yeah. song. Oh, definitely, and it's it definitely it definitely helps express uh, Remy's love for um, uh, for cooking because uh, m- much like um, much like anybody with uh, something they're really uh, passionate about, they they take a lot of pride in the work that they um, in the work that they uh, carry out. Be it um, uh, be be it like um, like painting artists with uh, the, the paints that they use to be able to create the uh, the pieces of art that they uh, they make. One particular example of that being the late great Bob Ross, and his as his work is just fantastic especially his especially his uh, happy little trees that he often paints on his um uh, pictures especially the uh uh the nature scapes that he paints um yep. as well um but um and then we get to probably for me the most powerful shot throughout the, the most powerful shot throughout the entire film the ratatouille is served to uh, Anton. He, he gets he primes his pen, ready to start writing. He, t- he takes um uh, he takes a bite, and then flashback to when he was when he's a, uh, a kid, and you can actually see that he's uh, he's had a couple of them um, cuts and scrapes on um, on his legs, and is um, who we can only assume to be his mum. Uh, cooks up some ratatouille for him, uh, has that, and he uh, he enjoys it. And I'm not gonna lie, folks. This is one of this is another one of those rare examples of me getting getting a bit emotional just watching this scene, just because of how powerful it is. Yep. I mean, I'm got, I mean, I mean, the, the first part here, slow motion. He drops the pen to the floor. It leaves him speechless. And honestly, there is no words to describe how powerful just that whole sequence is takes the yep. bite flashback back to pre- back to the present drops the pen and the like, little the little changes in his facial expression as it goes from stunned to smiling is perfectly animated yeah this is i say and this is probably one of the most this is probably one of the best animated examples of some character development yes for a, uh, especially for somebody as stone-hearted as anton ego is because having that dish it softens him it brings him back to his childhood and he and he enjoys the di- he enjoys the dish to the point where he even says it's been a long time since i've said to the waiter to send my compliments to the chef. I mean, I mean, that, I mean, if that doesn't say it was a phenomenal meal, I don't know what does. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, and then uh, Linguini and Colette they agree to let Anton see um, the chef that uh, the chef that made the meal itself, but. Uh, he says they have to, he, that uh, Anton has to wait until all the customers have left, and then when he get when they get round to sh- when they get round to showing, um, when they get round to showing um, uh, Anton who the chef is, and it turns out to be uh, Remy. Again, again, no dialogue from uh, from Anton at this point, just. It's just 
is facial expressions are all you need to know how he's feeling at that particular point in the film. Mm-hmm. And then and then he goes and then he goes away to write his review and say, saying that a saying that a phenomenal meal came from a very um unexpected source without as it, of course without directly referencing that it was for lack of a better term a rat that helped make that uh, made yeah. the, made the dish mm-hmm. but um but of course um but of course, during this whole fear, of course, during this uh, climax, he also had the health inspector and, of course, Skinner. They get locked. They get locked in the uh, the food pantry while um, while Anton's uh, while Anton's there. But then, but then, sadly, the restaurant does end up having to close down because, uh, well, when they found out that the um, restaurant was um, occupied uh, when the kitchen was occupied by rats. They say so they had to they had to close down the kitchen, uh, the kitchen and restaurant because of the uh, because of the health uh, code violations. But um, the um, let's say let's say, let's say uh, Anton out and out and about. He's uh, he's he's enjoying uh, he's enjoying uh, having his meals um, more often. So he's actually this is the point where he's actually retired from uh, critiquing food, and he's just out enjoying it for what it is mm-hmm. um and then linguini being the waiter um asking if um anton would uh, like anything for dessert and at the end of course anton definitely definitely looking forward to having the dessert and he um and then linguini asking him what, what he would like and then and then it's just such a whole just such a wholesome moment he he looks to the kitchen remy's looking through at the same time big smile on his face surprise me and remy's just like you got it and let's make and let's make some dessert yeah um, I'm, I'm feeling like a little bit emotional just remembering that moment it's it, yeah like so like i said it, like i said it, i was getting emotional throughout this uh throughout this finale as well yeah it's 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 perfectly done that's yeah the only way to describe it yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I think just, I mean, just, I mean, for, for me, that is probably the best, lo- but the best line of the entire film. Just surprise me, and Remy certainly did that when, when he, um, when he was outed as the one that was yeah. uh, um, ma- making all these phenomenal dishes, but, and 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 that's. I honestly couldn't think of a better line to finish the film with, but then we get this, no. and then we get this fantastic shot with La Ratatouille, and then as again the the Paris backdrop in a phenomenal sunset, and there you go, the end of the film. I say, I'm, I'm, I say like I said earlier. I honestly cannot think of anything to fault with this film. It is no, honestly, neither can I. Yeah, and I'll say this: the scores are definitely going to reflect that because you've still got a tie at the top between Monsters Inc. and um, actually, okay, does up if I actually had the scores up to, uh, before the start of the episode, but uh, but yes, yeah, so still a tie at the top between uh, Monsters Inc. And the Incredibles with 104% at the top. Uh, the last episode, Cars, um, tied with a Bugs Life at the bottom of the scoreboard so far. Granted, we've only done a handful of Pixar films so far, um, but still 104% to beat. And so, yeah, so, so anyway, let, sorry, let's go through these. Let's go through these uh, anyway. So um, the story, I couldn't, I couldn't give the story any less than an 11. That's how good this. Um, that's how that's how good the story is throughout. Just like I say, just every beat matching what was happening on the screen uh, throughout, and then just overall, just the story of um, tying in to Gusto's uh, philosophy, and it is, it's definitely in in terms of 
in terms of the creativity, this is probably the most mature uh, Pixar film that we've covered so far in terms of how creative this film is. Probably. So, yeah. So, so what would, so what would you give the story based on that? I give it a perfect 10. Okie doke, which then gives us a 10.5 there. So, let's say, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say this right now. I had, ele- I had 11s across the board th- for each of the... Um... Oh, oh, sorry. The, oh, uh, uh, there was a bit of a glitch. I didn't know we had the option for 11s. No, bump mine up to 11. All righty then. <laughs> so there we go. So, so, so like I said, so like I say, let's say for, for, the, for, for each of the five categories, the story, the characters, the visuals, the soundtrack, and the, the legacy... I had I had elevens across the board. So I'm I'm just intrigued to hear what Alan had um, on on his I, end. Oh, hang on. Uh, right, take your time. Uh, but like I said, the characters the characters also got an eleven for what, me. What what can I say? I oh, why do we have all these connection issues? I I completely agree with you. Elevens for days. Well, there we go. <laughs> Am I back? Uh, yeah, yeah. There we go. So, so there we go. That was so. That was easy. Uh, but uh, so we'll, we'll go. We'll go into a bit more detail regarding the legacy, uh, especially. <laughs> but um, but uh, I'll say the characters are just so well written. The development of uh, the development throughout as well, and like I say, that shot of Anton being softened at the end of the film as well, just absolutely. It's like just just no words for how powerful that that shot is. The visuals cannot fault them. I say the say the nighttime shot of Paris uh, near the beginning of the film, and then of course the last shot that we that we had at the end of the film uh, as well, with that fantastic sunset in the background as well. Just um, I say the soundtrack, uh, much much like much like going to a bit about the story, just matching every single emotional every single story beat that we see so every story and emotional beat i should say um throughout the films uh, throughout the films so i said cannot praise giacchino's soundtrack uh enough and the legacy of this film pretty much um uh, pretty much sums it up uh really uh the um uh, the right to rewind i've already mentioned that was in the marketing uh, critical response: ninety six percent on Rotten Tomatoes. So yeah, definitely. So praise definitely um, well earned. With the consensus saying, fast paced and stunningly animated, Ratatouille adds another delightfully entertaining entry and a rather unlikely hero to the Pixar canon. And in terms of Metacritic, that has ninety six as well. It is the highest rated Pixar film on Metacritic. And some, yep. of the, and some of the other films that are in the top 10 animated films on Metacritic include films like uh, Pinocchio, Beauty and the Beast, uh, the original Toy Story as well, and a couple of Studio Ghibli projects as well, Spirited Away and Grave of the Fireflies. Now, when you've got something like Ratatouille in a field that includes Pinocchio, Beauty and the Beast and Studio Ghibli in there as well. You know this film definitely did something right as far yeah, as uh, and, critical reception and, is concerned. And, and it holds its own. Yeah. As I, and, the, and this is the great thing with this film. It still holds up really well today, even, even 15 mm-hmm. years after, after, it's been, um, after it's been released. Um, so, so they just... Universal. It's just one of those, you know, timeless. It's one of those timeless things, you know. It's yeah. It, it can exist at any time, and it's 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 great in all those times. Yeah, and I say there's another powerful line in this film that uh, that we didn't bring up. Um, um, that uh, that I'm pretty sure ties into one of the uh, lines in uh, Anton's. Uh, review of the meal that he had at the end of the film that uh, not anyone uh, not everyone can be an artist but an artist can come from anywhere 
Yeah. And he's and he's not is. wrong on that assessment. No, not at all. Yeah. Uh, box office earnings now, and uh, we've got. Uh, it, was a, it was a it was a fairly successful film uh, with a budget of 150 million dollars, much like uh, Cars uh, last time out. Uh, this one ended up making quadruple uh, its budget with 623 uh, million dollars uh, worldwide, and in North America alone, it made 206 uh, million dollars. Um, and it was, uh, dis- despite it being Pixar's lowest opening since uh, A Bug's Life, it's still, like I said, it still ended up being um, fairly really successful at the box office. Um, it's got a number of accolades uh, to its name uh, as well. Um, the incredible thing here, Ratatouille, um, so I'll actually go, actually go through the um some of the accolades that it got. Uh, the biggest thing was, of course, best. It actually got five Oscar nominations uh, that year as well. So, uh, nominated for best original screenplay, best anim- uh, best original score, best sound editing, and best sound mixing. But it won for best animated feature uh, that year as well. Um, it got um, it got an incredible thirteen. Any nominations as well. Uh, it won for uh, best animated feature, character animation, character design, best directing, music, production design, storyboarding. Uh, it got three nominations in the best voice acting uh, in an animation feature production category. Uh, one for Colette, one for Remy, and it won for Ian Holm as uh, Skinner, and it's hard to argue with that one. Uh, Brad Bird also won an Annie for, so he won an Annie for not just best directing, but also best writing in an animated feature production. Um, it won, he managed to win a, he managed to win a BAFTA as well that year as well for best animated film. Uh, it won a lot of best animated feature uh, awards. Chicago Film Critics, um, it was, nom- it was nominated in M- in the Empire Awards that year for Best Film and Best Comedy, uh, be- a Golden Globe for Best Animated Film. Uh, the sound, the score itself, the score soundtrack album managed to win a Grammy. So, an Oscar, a Golden Globe, a BAFTA, and a Grammy for this film. Yep. I mean, if if that's not testament to how good this film is, I don't know what is. Mm-hmm. Um, I say, and right at the bottom here, Young Artist Awards for uh, Best Family Feature Film in Animation, uh, and managed to win for that. Uh, Visual Effects Society uh, Awards got nominated for four awards, and it managed to win in three of those categories. Outstanding Animated Character for Colette, Outstanding, it was nominated for Outstanding Effects for the Rapids, and it won for Outstanding Effects for its food, uh, and Outstanding Supporting Visual Effects in a Motion Picture as well. And that's where you had the likes of uh, Michael Fong, uh, Apurva Shah, Christine uh, Vagona, uh, uh, Christine Wagona, and Michael Fu um, winning, uh, winning those awards. Uh, so yeah, that uh, that is just so like I say, the accolades they pretty much they pretty much uh, speak for themselves. So I say thirteen. They do. I say, I say thirteen Annie Award nominations. I mean, not very often you see a film being nominated for that many um, awards at a single ceremony as well. This had a number of um, movie tie-in games uh, in the two thousand and seven um, the a video game. The primary video game adaptation for the film uh, released on all major consoles and handhelds in 2007. There was a DS exclusive game, which was just basically a, a mini game of just cook, uh, cooking the dishes in the film, titled Ratatouille Food Frenzy, which I actually remember playing a fair bit when it came out. Um, but this isn't the only time that Remy would be involved with cooking mini games because we get cooking mini games in Twilight Town, in Kingdom Hearts 3. Remy is part 
of Kingdom Hearts. And I say he's got his own, he's got his um, he's part of the bistro that's in uh, Twilight Town, which is owned by Scrooge McDuck, who is sitting outside uh, the bistro. And there's actually a couple of trophies. Uh, there's actually a couple of trophies and achievements, uh, depending on what platform you're on, be it Xbox or PlayStation, that tie into getting a perfect uh, get a perfect rank in all of the uh, cooking mini games. And you and you can actually collect the ingredients for these mini games uh, throughout your time playing the game uh, itself. Uh, and if you manage to perfect all the dishes, you get a couple of trophies for you. Uh, for your efforts as well. So the mini games serve a purpose in terms of their uh, uh, completion. And I do have the platinum trophy for Kingdom Hearts 3. I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, but oh my word, I had so, I had a great time covering the um, uh, the Kingdom Hearts franchise um, when that episode went live uh, earlier this week, celebrating 20 years of Kingdom Hearts. And I was like, for lack of a better term, Kingdom Hearts is one of the best video game franchises I've ever uh, been able to uh, experience and despite coming on as late as I did just a couple of years before Kingdom Hearts 3 came out because I didn't have it I didn't have like the proper means to be able to play the, uh, the series that being said though I've got the entire series on both my Xbox and my PlayStation and I just I just love I, I can now officially call myself a very dedicated uh, Kingdom Hearts fan given how much I, I love the games now um <laughs> There's even been a couple of um, there's, there's even a couple of theme park attractions as well. There's a Disney theme park attraction based on the film uh, that was constructed um, at the uh, at uh, Walt Disney Studios Park, Disneyland Paris, and there was also um, so it was the I say Remy's Ratatouille Adventure. It's called, and it features in both Disneyland Paris and the Walt Disney Studio Parks. Um, as well, both of which, as uh, I say, the studio parks are in Disneyland Paris as well, based upon scenes from the film and uses trackless ride technology. And in the attraction, riders shrink down to the size of a rat. And at, 20, at the 2017 D23 Expo, uh, Disney announced the attraction would be built at the France Pavilion in Epcot's World Showcase. And it opened uh, just a few months ago. Uh, October 1st, 2021, during the 50th anniversary of Walt Disney World and the 39th anniversary of Epcot. Uh, there's been an unofficial musical, uh, so I'll go into a bit regarding that. In late 2020, the users, users from the social media app TikTok crowdsourced the creation of a musical based on the film. A virtual concert presentation of it, produced by Seaview Productions, streamed for 72 hours on Today Ticks beginning on January 1st, 2021, to benefit the Actors Fund in response to the COVID-19 pandemic with their uh, actors and singers not being able to uh, perform at shows, in, in, at any shows uh, entertainment-wise because of the, because of the, uh, because of, like all the theatres and arenas were all uh, shut down. Uh, well, closed down, I should say. Yes. Uh, uh, it, it was directed by six co-creator and co-director Lucy, uh, Lucy Moss from a screen, for a script from a script adaptation by Michael Breslin and Patrick Foley, uh, both of whom were co both of whom managed to co uh, co executively produce the concert with Jeremy O'Harris, and the cast included Kevin Chamberlain as Gusto, Andrew Barth Feldman as Linguini, uh, Titus Burgess as Remy. Uh, Adam Lambert as Emil. Uh, Adam Lambert um, appeared on Glee for a number of episodes and also uh, tours alongside uh, Queen uh, as well. I mean, that that's that's de that's definitely a show I'd love to see at some point. Adam Lambert with um, uh, with Queen definitely definitely a show I'd love to see at some at some point. Wayne Brady as Django, or Priscilla Lopez as uh, Mabel. Ashley Parker's Colette and Andre De Shields as Anton Ego, uh, Owen Tabaka as a young Anton Ego, and Mar Mary Tester as Skinner. Interesting. And the, and, uh, the concert managed to raise $1.9 million for the Actors Fund. So uh, definitely not bad going. I mean, could, I mean, could you imagine if that ended up being turned into an official musical and it could end up being on say the West End in London. 
I mean, I mean, look, if that were to happen, yeah, I'd be, I'd be sold. Uh, I, I would, I would definitely I get a couple. I would of... pay good money to go and see that. Oh, oh, me as well, me as well. Um, so yeah, um, so yeah, not, not really too difficult to, um, not really too difficult to add up the scores there, but uh, uh, to take to take a page out of a certain memes playbook, ladies and gentlemen, we got him. We have a new leader at the top of the scoreboard for the Kingdom of Isolation, uh, for the Pixar run of the Kingdom of Isolation. Ratatouille, the first Pixar film to get a perfect 110%. Yes! Yes! But will, but will, that, will that be the only Pixar film that gets the 110 the elusive 110%, because this is only the second film ever in a Kingdom of Isolation to be able to get um, the 110%, the first one, of course, being uh, Beauty and the Beast. But, um, but, I mean, I'm not detracting from Inside Out being my favourite Disney film. No, I, was, I, was, I, still, I, still, I still enjoy Inside Out uh, a lot, and, and I'm always going to have a soft spot for it. But, yeah. In terms of how the film was made and the amount of care and attention that this film got, it's it's akin to the film getting the Michelin star treatment that it deserved, much akin to the Michelin star dishes that you get in these French restaurants. That is a great way of putting it. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, I, I, I still stand by uh, Inside Out being... Um, my favorite uh, Pixar film, but right now, Ratatouille is, at, for the time being, the best Pixar film that we've covered in the Kingdom of Isolation so far. Mm-hmm. And on that sentiment, it is time to end uh, this episode. So, um, uh, Alan, merci beaucoup for uh, helping me cover this absolute masterpiece from uh, Pixar's catalog my pleasure yeah and uh and a big thanks to you guys as well uh for watching this episode if you enjoyed the episode hit the thumbs up and if you want to be part of the kingdom of isolation uh you can hit the subscribe button down at the bottom and click the bell to uh, so that you're notified whenever an episode uh goes live uh the next thing for me to sort out is getting my guest list complete for the uh, next run of their Disney films because uh, we're going to be heading back to traditional Disney for the uh, foreseeable future before we get back to uh, Pixar territory. Um, I've already got guests sorted for Fantasia 2000, The Emperor's New Groove, Atlantis the Lost Empire, uh, Treasure Planet, Chicken Little. Uh, I've got somebody penciled in for Meet the Robinsons. So the only films left to fill slots for are Dinosaur, Lilo and Stitch, Brother Bear, Home on the Range, and uh, Bolt. So I'm, so I'm just going to throw those out there in case Alan wants to help me cover a couple of those uh, films later down the road. Sure. So, yeah, so we'll discuss we'll discuss all that um, uh, off camera. So um, I, I, I don't think there's really any other way for me to uh, to finish this episode off with apart from. Uh, uh, we hope you guys. Uh, we hope you guys. Uh, if you if you're um, if you're out tonight uh, have, um, uh, at a restaurant, we hope we hope you guys have a wonderful meal there. And on that note, we will see you guys next time in the Kingdom of Isolation. Bon nuit. <laughs>